Hello, everyone. My name is Deborah Ingravallo. I am the liaison with Food Export Northeast, and I am based in the Philadelphia, Pennsylvania office. Thank you for joining us today for this preview call of the Focus Trade Mission to China. I am joined on this call by Ian Shin, who is the in-market representative from China, as well as Roger Zhang, who is his counterpart. Our activity coordinator for this event is Jeffrey Phillips, who is with the Minnesota Department of Agriculture, who is traveling and unfortunately is unable to join us today. The previous session is dedicated to the Focus Trade Mission to China to discuss the markets, products of interest, and general itinerary of the mission. We will also discuss the cost to participate as well as registration. This call will last about 30 minutes and it will be recorded and posted to our website. Please note that everyone is muted. We encourage you to ask questions through the Q&A box and we will discuss them following the presentation. Questions that are not addressed will be answered in an email. Later, you'll see a slide of our liaison team who you can contact with any questions and for any help or further information that you may need. Um, for those of you who are unfamiliar with Food Export, we are a nonprofit organization working with agricultural promotion agencies from 13 Midwestern states and 10 Northeastern states. We provide support that U.S. companies need to enter international markets. We have in-market representatives from around the world to assist U.S. exporters with their international marketing efforts. And on the next slide, you will see a listing of those markets and countries where we do have representation. And at this time, I'd like to hand it over to Ian and to Roger, who you will meet if you decide to participate um, in this mission. So take it away, Ian and Roger. Okay, and uh, good morning, everyone. And uh, I'm glad you know the and you'll be here with us. And also, thanks so much for your interest in the Chinese market. As Deborah mentioned, this is the, after three years, the COVID situation. It's the very first the, and the in-person mission to China. And also, we select the, the two cities. And the first is the Beijing. Beijing, is, as you know, the, it's the, the first tier cities. Also, we go to the, the Xi'an as well. Xi'an, you know, the most famous city for the terracotta. And also, this is the, is the emerging market in the China. And so, I think about, you know, for both the cities, is the can be help you to fully understand what's going on in China. So I just hand over here. I just thanks again for your support of our program in China. And uh, I just hand over to Yan and share more information about the upcoming mission and what's going on here. Yeah, yeah, please. Thank you, Roger. And thank you, Deborah, um, for allowing us to um, talk about our trade mission to our fellow exporters. So. Um, my name is Ian Chen, and I am the in-market representative for food export in China. So, um, as you can see here in the in the mission itinerary, um, the mission will be um, starting on August 21st and to the 25th. So, on the 21st on Monday, um, the delegation will arrive in Beijing, and then on Tuesday, the 22nd, we will have a market briefing at the USDA FAS Agricultural Trade Office in Beijing. Um, and then after the briefing, we will go on a retail tour around the city, um, check out a few retail stores um, so we can get an idea of what's on the market. And you can also do your own research on the type of products that are being sold in the local market. And on Wednesday, the 23rd, we will have the one on one-on-one -on -one meetings with buyers before having a showcase um, showcase luncheon where um, you can have further discussions with your buyers and also to other people. Um, and in the evening, we will be flying to Xi'an, which is about two hours away. And the next day on Thursday, August 24th, we'll have a retail tour around the city before heading back to the hotel for one-on-one -on -one meetings. And closing out the entire mission, we will also have a showcase dinner in the city. 
And on the 25th on Friday, um, you will be heading back to the States. So a pretty intense and packed itinerary, um, which can basically take a quick sneak peek of what's going to happen. So um, on the left, that is the US Embassy in Beijing, where the ATO briefing is going to happen. And then um, the retail tour, market tour, um, you can see that we've in previous missions, we've gone to, we've taken our suppliers to local stores and check out um, what's in store. And also the one-on-one -on -one meetings with our buyers. So um, very interesting and um, useful mission that is going to be. So um, I'm sure a lot of you already know about China, but for those who are not familiar with it, um, China is the most populous country in the world with 1.4 billion people, and it's the large, second largest economy in the world. And well, for much of the past decade or so, China has been growing at double digits. But um, since COVID, um, we're seeing some of the slowest growth in recent years, um, actually since the 90s. Um, and forecast for this year and the next is going to be lingering around 5%. But the reopening of the country um, may help improve that number. We're not sure, but we're hopeful. Uh, per capita income, although it's still growing, it's still ranked considerably lower than a lot of the developed countries. Um, but there is an emerging middle class that is rising and growing in size. Today, there's roughly 400 million Chinese consumers who are considered in the middle class, uh, many of them in the lower middle class, but in larger cities, you're gonna see more of them in the upper middle class. And the internet is widely used in China with around 1 billion netizens, meaning only around 400 million of the entire population is not online. And with that many in online users, um, China is also the largest e-commerce market in the world and is led by the likes of Alibaba and JD.com. And more and more people are buying food and drinks online, especially imports. China imported $2.7 trillion worth of agricultural products from the world in 2022, making it one of the largest importers in the world and also one of the most important. And despite the impact of, uh, from COVID, um, which practically saw China close itself off for, from the world for three years, uh, it remains one of the largest and most important consumer markets in the world, just behind the United States. It is also the most important trade partner for US agriculture, ranking first in the world from 2020 to 2022. Uh, there was some setback uh, in terms of imports way back in 2018, 2019 because of the trade war. Um, but since the signing of the phase one agreement in 2020, uh, China has regained its top spot. And as you can see in this graph in red, um, most of China's imports from the US, um, basically around 70% are bulk commodities like corn, cotton, or sorghum. But we're definitely seeing consistent and steady growth for consumer products as well, which is in yellow. Oh. Last year, um, China's imports of China can, uh, of US cons consumer products was up 7% to 7.2 billion, which is an all time high. And these products include meat, seafood, dairy, tree nuts, dried fruits, pet food, um, alcoholic beverages, and also bakery ingredients. The imports of these products are primarily driven by first tier cities. And there are currently four mainstays in terms of first tier markets. And these are 
Shanghai, Beijing, Guangzhou, and Shenzhen. And for this trade mission, we're going to be concentrating on the North China market, which is where Beijing and Xi'an is. Uh, the former is a fairly mature, well-developed market, while the latter is considered one of the fastest emerging markets within the country with a lot of potential for growth. So a bit of a, a bit a bit of background information about the two cities that we're going to be going for this trade mission, starting off with Beijing. Uh, well, it is the capital of China and the most populous national capital city in the world with 21.8 million people. And there's a lot of history with Beijing itself. It is one of the cities, it is one of the oldest cities in the world with over 3,000 years of history. And this is also a city that blends the old with the new. And today it is one of the world's leading centers for culture, finance, business, business and economics, tourism, media, science and technology, as well as transportation. Uh, earlier, we saw how China's per capita income is ranked 69th in the world, not great. But as we can see here, uh, the per capita income in Beijing is more than doubled that of the national average, which means local consumers can afford more expensive things like imported food and, foods and drinks, which in turn make, makes it one of the most important markets for exporters like you guys. And for Xi'an, which is, as I mentioned earlier, west, uh, which is west of Beijing and two hours by plane, it is the capital of Shanxi province with almost 13 million people. It is a cultural, industrial, political, and educational center of the central northeast region of China. And with, as uh, Roger mentioned earlier, this is where the terracotta army and also a lot of very ancient uh, architecture and sites, historic sites are at. So it is considered it considered the second most popular tourist destination in China. And like I said earlier, um, Xi'an is an emerging market with a growing economy and improving infrastructure and logistics. Uh, but there's still quite a bit of a gap in terms of per capita income, which is more in line with the national average. Nonetheless, I think there's a lot of room for growth, especially for imported foods. And in terms of the retail market in China, total consumer goods sales fell marginally in 2022 due to the many lockdowns and restrictions from COVID, but in turn, this helped grow the online shop uh, retail industry with overall online sales up by 4% and especially for food, which went up by 16% last year. And uh, as mentioned earlier, China has the world's largest e-commerce market and evidently online sales now makes up around 27% of total retail consumer sales. And a lot of e-commerce e companies are starting to gain ground over the traditional brick and mortar offline retailers. With uh, the tide turning and really no signs of stopping, uh, many of these traditional retailers in the past three years have developed their own online shopping platforms uh, using via things like uh, mobile apps or social media. Um, but because of the pandemic, many retailers are very cautious about uh, when it comes to introducing new products and even more so for imports because of uh, the virus scared uh, in the past two years and also because the very, of the very strict import requirements. And, but the good thing is that the attitude is starting to slowly change 
since this year uh, with the scrapping of China's zero COVID policy. So things are heading towards the right way, I think. And for the ingredients market, because China has pumped up its food production um, during the past two years because of COVID, uh, we saw consumer demand for things like shelf stable and long shelf life products grew considerably uh, as people are worried about potential lockdowns, by the way, which no longer applies. Uh, we don't have to think anymore. But even during the heights of the pandemic, demand for imported dairy, tree nuts, dry fruits, and other products that are known for having good health or nutritional properties have remained stable. And for other ingredients, the higher supply chain costs and unreliability, which includes long quarantine periods at port, as well as segregated storage, uh, drove overall product cost. Um, all of these have led many to source more ingredients domestically. And the past few years, we've seen a lot of changes in terms of where the market was headed. And with COVID, we also see long-term, maybe permanent changes to consumer behavior. Some of these are already very apparent. For example, retail digitalization, digitalization which saw uh, most major retailers going digital. And this includes everything from using technology to improve consumer experience, delivery speed, logistics, and supply chain. And big data is also being utilized by retailers to research their key customers and what they want. And the new ship, the shipping disruptions and new government regulations, uh, which we'll talk about later, um, have led to depleted inventories at retail stores. And this has in turn led to an increase in retailers offering private label products, especially for products like beverages, tree nuts, and dairy. And during the pandemic, there's also a much greater demand for long shelf life products that can withstand extended period of time of lockdowns and food shortages. And also with the virus, we also saw a heightened sense of health and wellness, and this applies to the food we eat as well. More and more sophisticated consumers, especially in first tier cities are um, purchasing food with clean label claims. And manufacturers are also following this trend by developing immune, immune boosting foods using ingredients such as prebiotic, probiotics, vitamins or other functional foods. And last but not least, uh, ready to cook meal kits are one of the hottest trends in China today. Um, it gained popularity again during the heights of the pandemic where many restaurants were shut down or had reduced their services. And this is seeping into the retail sector as well with many online retailers and grocery stores uh, reporting a jump in turn in their turnover for ready to cook meals. And the last thing for now uh, that I want to talk about is some of the policies and regulations that are affecting exporters. So for example, one of the most important and impactful policy to exporters, not just the US, but for the entire world is what is known as Decree 248, which requires overseas exporters and their production or storage facilities to register with the General Administration of Customs China or GAC. So under this policy, um, if a product from an improperly registered facility was shipped out and arrived in China before the facilities were approved by GAC, the shipment will most likely, or if not most certainly, uh, be detained at port. Uh, there is a long list of food and drink products that are required to be registered, and the list is periodically being updated. So it is 
very important to stay updated. And the best way to do this is to keep an eye on the USDA's gain reports, which is extremely valuable uh, for any exporters looking to do business in China. On the other hand, uh, since China has announced the end of its zero COVID policy, quarantine requirements for people arriving from a board, uh, from a board uh, was dropped earlier this year in January. And um, there is still a little bit of um, requirements as far as traveling to China as of today. So you're still required to show a negative virus test uh, 48 hours before your flight departs. And this, um, the, the dropping of the COVID policy also applies to exporting foods as well. Uh, we're testing for, for the virus on imported cold chain and non-cold chain food was finally dropped uh, in earlier January. So all in all, China still has some way to go before it fully returns to its pre-COVID days, but it's on its way and there's a lot of potential and a lot of room for more growth. And I hope by listening, you will not only learn more about China and how the market is doing today, but also feel encouraged to sign up for the trade mission. Um, so thank you so much for uh, listening to this part of the webinar, and I will turn this back to Deborah. Great. Thank you, Ian. Thank you, Roger. And I just want to remind everyone that this uh, presentation is being recorded. So if you'd like to go back and reference, um, it will be available on our website. Um, Pricing and registration deadlines are listed here. Just a reminder that the early bird deadline is coming up on April 19th uh, for $400 and the standard deadline is on May 31st uh, for $600. We encourage everyone to register early, not only because of the price difference, but also because it is a focused trade mission, which means that participation is limited. Um, you wanna make sure you secure your spot. Um, here's a listing of the services that will be included on the trade mission. I think that the most popular or the one that I as a liaison get the most questions about is that tabletop showcase or reception. You may have seen an earlier slide in the itinerary that Ian had mentioned. Um, there will be two tabletop showcases. One will be in the afternoon at the first stop in Beijing, and the other will be um, in the evening at the next stop, which is in Xi'an. One-on-one um, -on -one meetings, of course, are always included. Um, market briefing by the local USDA or the you know, FAS, ATO office, um, always very important. So please make sure you plan your travel accordingly. And uh, both Ian and Roger will be on site um, you know, for any questions that you may have. Um, this is a list of all of our liaisons, both in here in Philadelphia in the Northeast and also in Chicago in the Midwest. Um, we are all assigned respective uh, states, and we just ask that you contact the liaison according to where your company is headquartered. Um, we want to thank you for your time. We're going to move into some, some Q&A before we go. We'll leave this slide up just so you have all the contact information just in case you have any questions. Um, Ian and Roger, we just want to ask, I know you had touched on it a little bit, um, what is the COVID situation um, in China and is it safe to travel? Uh, yeah, actually, oh, no, Roger. Uh, uh, Ian, you go ahead. No, um, yeah, I was just going to say that, um, yeah, it's since January, uh, the, the highest wave has passed and I think today people are not really worried about it and we're still wearing masks but no one's really talking about the virus anymore so i think we're very much easing back into the pre-covid days and obviously there's no more daily testing there's no tracking apps that that's required and as i mentioned earlier the traveling policy is also a lot more relaxed so the only thing the only little thing is that you need to 
get get a test done before you before you fly out. So, but once you land it, there's there there's nothing required, and it's safe to go outside and be around. Yes, yes, and also our mission still there almost uh, five months away. I think in the next five months something will getting better and better. And also, I concerning you know the right now the United and the China the flight is still limited. If you we decide you know you decide to join the mission, I think it's as early as possible. If we want to decide join to to our mission, and we can book the ticket and to China make the the ticket fare will be more reasonable. This is very important, you know. I don't want you pay the very high, the, you know, the, the airfare <laughs> to the China because of the very limited flight. That is the, I, a little bit concerning for that. So yeah, that 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 is. I I don't want you pay the extra money, you know, <laughs> to, to make it, make your cost too high. <laughs> Excellent. Thank you, Roger. And thank you, Ian. I just want to remind um, all the participants as well that um, the branded program that Food Export offers um, has 50% reimbursement on eligible expenses, and that would include the travel, the lodging, and the meals uh, to this mission. Uh, the next question is, are Chinese buyers looking to buy from the U.S. right now? Yeah. Yes, there are definitely um, looking at either starting to buy from the US or restarting business with suppliers from the US. So um, as in-market representatives, we regularly uh, speak to importers and distributors and retailers around the country. And um, we've been hearing more and more of them asking for certain products uh, that you know, from from the United States, and so we're, we're as I mentioned earlier in the webinar, um, things like dairy, uh, meat, especially. But I'm not sure if we have any meat exporters around for this trade mission. So, but tree nuts, dry fruits, and also healthy snacks, uh, pet food as well, and alcohol alcoholic beverages. So these are these are the most in demand products that we've been hearing from from importers and buyers around the country in the past two to three months. So Chinese buyers are definitely looking to, to work with suppliers from the United States again and buy. Thank you, Ian. Thank you, Roger. Um, we do have another question related to alcoholic beverages, specifically for hard cider. Um, what's the possibility of exporting you know, alcoholic products such as hard cider. Um, I know we had a, a, um, a supplier who was recently at a mission um, and had met you at the mission and uh, just, just was hoping you could elaborate just a little bit more on that, on the hard cider. It has about four and a half percent alcohol. Well, I think the overall, the whole alcoholic beverage demand is up from before, especially for uh, countries like the US. Um, more buyers in China when it comes to different types of alcoholic beverages. So um, they prefer wine from Europe, uh, but beer or cider, a lot of them are looking at the US for, for innovation and coming up with the newest flavors and you know cool packaging so these are these are elements that work very well with retailers in china they like they like to bring out the most you know the cooler cooler packaging beer or canned cider so yes i think oh and also at one point uh, there's also a bit of a trend for low out low abv um, alcoholic beverages. So I guess 4% would be considered sort of in the lower, lower percentage. So um, this works very well for the female consumer group. Great. 
Thank you, Ian. We'll make sure that they get the registration in early for sure. Um, and we just, I know we're almost out of time, but we just have one last question. Uh, regarding the facility registrations, are there any more details that you could provide on that process? Yeah, sure. Um, I know we're a bit short of time, so I'm going to make it quick. Uh, so, in short, um, the Chinese Customs has a list of products that um, it's divided into two parts. So one part, for example, meat, dairy, seafood, uh, et cetera, they require the company, the exporters company or the production facility or and the storage facilities to be registered with the customs through a local authority. So for example, your local state USDA office, um, and for a list of other products, maybe for example, snacks or cider, um, those you can do it by your own. So there's a self registration platform that you can apply uh, with the Chinese customs. So um, the, like I mentioned earlier, the USDA gain reports, they have a lot of information on the registration process, the list of products that are uh, in the requirements. So uh, definitely you can grab one of those reports and it will have most, if not all of the information. Great. All right, thank you so very much um, to both of you for joining us today and, and to everyone else who participated. Uh, we appreciate your participation in this call um, and we look forward to seeing you on the mission.